And now I'm very happy to introduce our own Elizabeth Logason. Dr. Logason is an associate clinical professor here at UCLA. She is um, the founder and director of the UCLA Peers Clinic, and she's also the training director of the UCLA Tarjan Center, uh, which is a university uh, uh, center of excellence in developmental disabilities. And she's also a member of our um, Autism uh, Center of Excellence, where she directs our education and outreach course. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Logason. All right, thank you, Susan. You guys hanging in there? All right, good. All right, so I'm going to be sharing with you um, some information about evidence-based treatments uh, to improve social outcomes in young adults with autism. We haven't talked a lot about adults today, and, and so we wanted to end the day with focusing on some treatments that we found to be effective in improving social outcomes in this population. I think we all know, I, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but we all know, sadly, that um, the outcomes, social outcomes among adults on the spectrum are, are rather poor, sadly. Um, we know there's a higher underemployment and, and unemployment rate among adults on the spectrum, something like 20% of adults on the spectrum are gainfully employed, even though they're very, very bright often and very talented in many ways, but have difficulty finding and maintaining employment. They have less post-secondary educational experiences. They'll often get into college, um, but then often drop out, um, often because of the social challenges that they face. Um, they tend to be more dependent on family members and caregivers. They tend to um, live at home, don't often live independently. And, and for the many of the young adults that I work with here at UCLA, um, they, they're less likely to have a driver's license. And you know, imagine trying to navigate Los Angeles without a car um, or a driver's license. So they're very dependent on family members. Um, and they tend to be more isolated. I think we all know that. I mean, there is a, a greater incidence of, of social isolation among people on the spectrum, but we, we've found in our own research, when you look at cross-sectional research of, of social engagement um, across early childhood, adolescence, and adulthood, our adults are significantly more socially isolated, and many people would argue that's because they don't have access um, to their peers to the degree they did when they were um, in school. Um, so they tend to have fewer close, meaningful friendships. They very rarely have romantic relationships, even though many of them really desperately want to um, be in romantic relationships and, and have friendships. Um, and there's also another thing we found in our, our research is a higher incidence of comorbidities. I think we all know that comorbidities or co-occurring um, diagnoses are very common in autism, particularly things like anxiety and depression, but we find that the incidence of anxiety and depression is significantly greater upon reaching adulthood. And many people would argue that might have something to do with the social isolation that they're experiencing. Um, so when you look at things like friendships, for example, which is something we, we focus a lot on in our research here at UCLA, um, among young adults with ASD, um, you know, not surprising, they, they do have very few reciprocal close friendships. However, if you were to ask a person with autism if they had friends, what do you think most people will say? They'll say they do have friends, and then you investigate further, and they can either name no one, um, or they'll name a, a whole list of people, but they've never had a get-together with them. They've never socialized outside of work or school if they happen to be in those settings. So they tend to have rather poor friendship quality. Um, they also, as I said, have increased social isolation on entering adulthood. And, and again, the argument there is that, well, if they're not working and they're not in school, then they're going to be more socially isolated. They're living at home very often and, and rather dependent on family members. So they have less involvement in social activities. I think, think about adolescence. You know, there's such an emphasis on extracurricular activities and you know, clubs and, and sports. That changes a lot when we reach adulthood. It's harder to find a social network if you're not working or going to school. They do tend to have more online friends, though. Um, but there's a difference between online friends and real life friends. Where do you think they find their online friends? Because it's not, you know, the typical social media like, you know, Facebook and Instagram and where do they? Games. Video games. Yeah, they're into gaming, and then that's which is great. That's great. And they'll have a lot of online friends because they play these these you know games online. But online friends aren't the same as real life friends. Um, and when it comes to um, you know we talked about social camouflage and, and the gender differences that you see um, in autism. Um, one of the other things that we often notice too is that. Um, in our clinic here at UCLA, where we, we conduct evidence-based social skills interventions, um, we really see two different types of individuals presenting, whether they're in preschool or all the way up until adulthood. And that is that they're either peer-rejected 
or they're socially neglected, and that may have something to do with social camouflage or gender, but essentially the difference is here, peer-rejected individuals are the ones who are actively seeking out their peers. They're trying to make friends, but they're getting pushed away. Right? And they're making social errors, like they're maybe hogging conversations and not letting the other person talk, kind of monologuing or lecturing, having very repetitive themes in their conversations, talking about the same thing over and over, maybe doing this thing I call policing, where they're always telling everybody what they're doing wrong all the time, pointing out like rule violation. People don't like that, right? And you get rejected. Or people who are trying to make jokes all the time, you know, and it's not working for them. And so they're getting rejected, but they, they are actively seeking out their peers. That's the peer rejected group. Now, then you also have this socially neglected group. And this is the group where they're not even trying to socially engage their peers. And they often go unnoticed. Um, and they're kind of like the little wallflowers. They just, they're not noticed by other people. And if you want to predict if an individual is peer rejected or socially neglected, we found a very easy way to do that without even being in their social milieu, without being in the workplace or in the school setting. Just think about the comorbidities. It's very rare that you meet someone with autism that doesn't have an, a co-occurring diagnosis. And what are the big co-occurring diagnoses that they have? ADHD, depression, and anxiety. Right. Who of those groups is more likely to barge into conversations, be off topic, talk about whatever they want to, try to be funny joke tellers? The ones with ADHD, they're more likely to be peer rejected. And then who's not even going to try to socially engage their peers? probably the depressed and anxious. Yeah, so it's a kind of a, a window into maybe what's happening to them socially. But this type, the two types of groups of individuals that we see in the spectrum, they both present for social skills training, but they have very different social presentations. Um, as I mentioned, romantic relationships, too, are an area of uh, issue for individuals on the spectrum. And um, very few adults on the autism spectrum actually have romantic relationships, even though many of them really want to. They have that desire. Um, they're also less likely to marry. Um, and there's, interestingly enough, um, you probably heard this, you maybe read this in the research literature, there's a higher incidence of stalking behavior in this population. But in fairness to adults on the spectrum, I don't think they're actually intentionally stalking. Um, we know that poor social cognition is a hallmark feature of autism, right? And what that means is social cognition is perspective taking. It's being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and anticipate how they'll think or feel or react in a given situation. And because people with autism struggle so much with social cognition, they make a lot of mistakes in these situations, maybe where they're trying to let someone know they like them romantically, and, um, and they're not picking up on the social cues that maybe they're, they're scaring the other person. So the, the common story that we hear in our clinic is um, we'll have a, a young adult, let's say it's a young adult male, he'll have a crush on someone. And for some reason, we always find that it's the, it's the barista at Starbucks. Um, <laughs> some of you heard me say this before, but it's like a constant theme. Why do you think they get a crush on the barista at Starbucks? They're friendly, right? They know your name, and they're friendly, and they're talking to you, and they remember your drink order. And so they get a crush on the barista at Starbucks. And how do you think that young man, maybe, will um, let that barista know that he, he likes her? Well, he'll show up, right, at Starbucks every day, which isn't uncommon. Lots of people do that. But what will he do when he arrives? Yes, exactly. He'll sit at a table, and I heard someone say stare, right, for hours at a time. And it looks like stalking behavior, but in fairness to this young adult, he's not stalking this barista. You know, he just doesn't know how to let her know that he likes her. And so this is a, another, you know, issue that many adults um, struggle with when it comes to romantic relationships. We also know that they tend to have less sexual knowledge and awareness. Where do you think they get most of their sex education from? Online, through porn, right, I mean, which isn't really the most realistic way to kind of learn about sex education and, and sexual knowledge. Um, the females that we work with, we've also discovered, um, have a greater risk for sexual exploitation and victimization. They don't know that it's not okay to just, you know, go over to somebody's house that you just met online or to get into a car with someone or to go to a hotel room and that these are risky situations. And so we have to teach them how to be safe. And, and then we also know that the males that we work with more often are at higher risk for um, financial exploitation. We've worked with a lot of young men that have come in in debt for their, um, you know, their romantic relationships. I had a young man that I worked with years ago who was forty thousand dollars in debt. Um, when he um, went away to college, he had an online girlfriend, and he would 
pay to have, I mean, it wasn't even a sexual relationship. It was just his online girlfriend. Um, and so it's, they're at greater risk for these types of situations and victimization. Um, sadly, though, um, even though we know that autism is a lifelong neurodevelopmental disability, even though the face of autism, have you noticed the face of autism is a child? really, but that's not actually the case. It's, it's a lifelong disorder, and even though we know that social deficits are a hallmark feature of autism, sadly, there are very, very few evidence-based treatments for adults on the spectrum, and there are very few evidence-based treatments that work on improving the social outcomes of adults on the spectrum. This is a, a population that has been largely ignored. Um, there's something that's called the Autism Services Cliff. A lot of you have probably heard of that before. And this is really true, not just in California, but really across the planet, I've discovered that most autism services fall off around the age of 21 or 22. And there's very, very little out there in terms of services and certainly not a lot of evidence-based services on top of that. Um, the research in this area has also historically ignored adults on the spectrum. And that is changing, but it is a slow process. And um, sadly, we're just not doing enough for this, this population. There's just a very limited amount of evidence-based treatments. And, and of the treatments that exist for adults on the spectrum, most of them are focused on young adults, usually between 18 to 24 years of age. Very little is focused on, on middle adulthood, older adulthood. Um, it's just, this is a, a, a population that's been largely ignored. Uh, most interventions, as we know, focus on, on younger children. And we know that early intervention is really, really important in autism. It sets you on a good trajectory. However, the social demands change across the lifespan. And providing social skills training in childhood is not going to be sufficient because the social demands are going to change and they're going to increase over time. And we have to keep up with those social demands. And so really this is sort of what led us to develop an intervention that we developed, developed actually here at UCLA going back to 2004. And the program is called PEERS. It stands for the Program for the Education and Enrichment of Relational Skills. Initially it was developed for adolescents on the autism spectrum. That was also back in 2004 a population that had really been largely ignored. Um, it was interesting. I was, I was doing um, evidence-based treatments to improve social skills for kids with FAS, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. I was working with that population at that time and my phone was ringing off the hook from parents of adolescents on the autism spectrum looking for services. And guess what? I had nowhere to refer them. And this is Los Angeles. This is a big place. Um, so there's this huge gap in services and, and definitely evidence-based treatments, once again, to improve these social outcomes. So we developed the PEERS program to target that adolescent population. And since then, it's expanded quite a bit. Now, this is a, now an international program. And it's used in over 30 countries, even though it was developed here at UCLA. And it's been translated into over a dozen languages. And we do cross-cultural validation trials across the globe. It's not just enough to translate a, a social skills intervention. You have to culturally adapt it and test it to make sure it's effective. Um, we started with adolescents, and then we've expanded to young adults. Um, and we also have a preschool program that we're currently testing as well. And these are some of the publications that have come out of our program. Um, th one thing you should know about CART um, is you know, we talk a lot about research in this symposium. But CART is the Center for Autism Research and Treatment. And so we're also very dedicated to providing services here at UCLA, but not just any services. We like to develop and, and test our interventions. And we're very dedicated to um, not only developing evidence-based treatments, but also disseminating them. In other words, we don't feel that everyone has, should have to come to UCLA to receive these evidence-based treatments. We're also very passionate about, about disseminating them through publishing manuals. And there's going to be a Jasper manual coming out very, very soon. Um, there's lots of interventions that we're working on developing here. Jeff Wood, if you know him, um, does work in evidence-based treatments to decrease anxiety um, in, in children with um, autism. So there's a lot of really kind of cutting edge work happening here. And, and this is just one of the, those programs. And so this program, this is our, our young adult program. Um, it focuses on friendships and romantic relationship skills, um, as well as things like conflict and rejection. And there's um, uh, things, you know, focusing on choosing appropriate friends, finding appropriate friends. Conversational skills are really, really important once you hit adulthood. Um, we need to know how to meet new people. And we do that by starting conversations or entering conversations with people, assessing interests, knowing how to exit conversations. And then the way that we all kind of develop close, meaningful friendships are, um, is by having get-togethers with friends and hanging out outside of school or working 
these are all skills that we can teach. Because the reality is we're all using skills all the time. We're following social rules and steps every moment of every day. We just don't realize it. It just happens so automatically. But we can teach those skills. We can break them down into their concrete parts and teach rules and steps of social behavior. We also teach um, skills related to dating etiquette. So there's actually ecologically valid skills for how to date, how to let someone know that you like them, how to flirt with someone, um, how to ask someone on a date. Um, there's lots of interesting, um, I'm actually going to give you a little snapshot of some of the skills that we teach if this is interesting to you. Um, and the latter part of the intervention, we also focus on peer conflict and rejection. So that's handling arguments and disagreements, um, as well as handling different forms of bullying, even adults get bullied. Um, there's four types of bullying, just so you know. There's uh, what's called verbal bullying, that'd be teasing with words. There's physical bullying, which for adolescents and children is usually aggression, but for adults it's pranking and exploiting people in some way, maybe taking advantage of them. Um, there's electronic bullying, which we refer to more commonly as cyber bullying. And then there's relational bullying. Um, which is more of, more of the female kind of bullying. It's sort of the rumors and gossip, social exclusion. And we have strategies for handling all of these forms of direct and indirect forms of, of bullying. I wanted to give you a couple of examples. One of the things I was tasked to do here today was to, to not just give you an overview of some of the programs that we have here, but to actually give you a few tools to use um, in practice. And, and this is one of the tools I wanted to share with you. This is um, sort of related to entering group conversations. It's a skill that we teach um, in peers. And I'm just kind of curious to know what you think that most young adults are told to do to meet new people because we discovered in our research that you know kids and adults they get advice all the time about what to do in social situations but they're not usually given very good advice um, so it's terrible right what do you think most adults are told to do to meet new people like they're going to a party they don't know anyone what are they supposed to do yeah go up and say hi go up and introduce yourself have you ever thought of what that would look like right imagine that you interrupt someone's conversation out there in the lobby hi I'm Liz Right? What do you think people would think of me? I interrupt their conversation. Hi, I'm Liz. They think that's weird. They're going to think I'm weird. And do you think they're going to want to talk to me? Of course not. So that's not really how it's done. Um, social skills are so automatic to most of us, we don't even realize what we're doing. And so um, we have to break these skills down into concrete parts. But the way we teach social skills is we, um, we do this in, a, in a, a very concrete way. We first want to demonstrate what not to do. We do a lot of role plays, like what to do, what not to do. Why do you think you would want to show what not to do? because that's probably what they're doing, right? Exactly. So this is probably what you would see out of a peer-rejected young adult. Remember the one that maybe has some impulse control issues? What do you think this person's going to do to enter this conversation if they're doing it incorrectly? They're going to barge in. They're going to interrupt. And what are they going to talk about? Whatever they want to talk about, exactly, themselves. All right, so this is Alina doing that very thing. You'll see who Alina is in just a moment. And watch to see what she's doing wrong in entering this conversation. Hey, Jordan, you'll never guess. I saw Gabe at my favorite sushi restaurant this weekend. No way. What restaurant was it? Um, just the one right around the corner. Oh, I've been meaning to try that place. Yeah. Yeah, it's so close by. I felt bad that I'd never gone, but I went, and it was so good. Nice. What did you guys get? I got the spicy tuna with crispy rice. Mm, yeah. yeah. It looked awesome. Have you guys ever been roller skating? Sorry. Um, I just got the regular salmon. There's roll. this new skate park that just opened up. I'm it's I'm really sorry. fun. What did you get? Um, just the salmon roll. It was oh, plain. They have so a Thursday good. night student night. A lot of people go to it. I have been meaning to go there. I yeah. really wanted to try it out. It's really, yeah. really fun. There's also this other place by the beach that I've been roller skating. I'm sorry, what? What would you get if you went? It's really cool. I it's like right by the water and lots of people <sighs> go. All right, so we would time and say, what did she do wrong? When it's not our young adults doing this, they can tell you what she did wrong because it's not them, right? We do some perspective taking that gets at the social cognition. What was that like for that group? What do they think of her? Would they want to talk to her again? And then we have to teach the ecologically valid steps. This is what you all probably naturally do. You just didn't realize that you were doing it. So the first thing is that you kind of watch the conversation and you listen to it. You're kind of eavesdropping, right? But you don't want to be staring at them because that's really creepy. So usually people have like a phone or something. Use a prop. You look distracted. Maybe it's the conference program or something. But you're trying to identify the topic. What are they talking about? And you need to know something about the topic. It has to be a common interest. And then if you decide to join, you're not going to join from across the room, right? You're going to move closer, usually no closer than about an arm's length away. You don't want to interrupt, so you usually wait for a little pause in the conversation. And then you mention the topic. And you do that in one of three ways. You either make a comment, you ask a question, or you give a compliment, right? It's something on topic, right? And then you kind of assess their interest. Now, here's another interesting thing. I often ask people, how can you tell if somebody wants to talk to you? Most people say it's a feeling that you get. 
Yeah, there are feelings, but there are also concrete behaviors that you're seeing, that you're observing, that give you the behavior. So what are they doing if they want to talk to you? They're looking at you, right? They're facing you, and they're actually talking to you. It's that simple. And then if things are going well and you've never met before, you could introduce yourself, but it's optional. So the next part of the formula of teaching this is to demonstrate the good example. So we'd say watch this role play. Think about what Alina's doing right this time. So Jordan, you'll never guess, I saw Gabe at my favorite sushi restaurant this weekend. Nice, what restaurant was it? Um, just the one right around the corner. Oh, I've been meaning to check that place out. Yeah, it's so close by and I'd never gone, but I went and it was really good. Cool, what did you guys get? I got a spicy tuna roll and I loved it. Yeah. You got the spicy tuna roll? That's what I always get. Yeah, how good is it? It's so good there. Have you guys tried the rainbow roll there? I haven't. No, I actually got the salmon roll. Oh, okay, that's good too, but yeah. the rainbow roll is their specialty. Cool. Yeah. If you were gonna go, what'd you get? I'll get the California roll. It's my favorite. I've tried that one there actually. It's really good. Nice. Okay, we would time out. We'd say, what did Alina do right? We go through the steps and then some more perspective taking. Now, the next part of this formula is now the adults have to practice this in the context of our group setting. And then to generalize the skills outside of the group, we give them homework assignments to practice this. And all of our programs are caregiver assisted. So there's either a parent or a job coach, a life coach, a peer mentor. Someone is supporting them outside of the treatment setting to make sure that the skills generalize. I wanted to, I couldn't resist. I wanted to show you one more skill and it relates to dating. Um, so what do you think that most um, young adults with autism do to ask someone on a date? They just walk up and say what? Hey, do you want to go on a date? Exactly. Um, right. And well, what do you think they're told to do? Just ask them on a date, which is what they do, right? And it's not how it works. So we're going to show the bad example first. We would say watch this role play. Think about what Gabe is doing wrong and asking out Alina here. Hi, do you want to go on a date with me? Um, <laughs> Come on, just one date. It'll be really fun. No, I'm good. But I'm a really nice guy. Can we just go on one date? No, thank you. I'm okay. <sighs> Come on. <laughs> okay. All right, so, um, so time out. We talked about all the things he did wrong, do some perspective taking, what was it like for Lena, and so on. And then we have to give the good example. There are ecologically valid steps that people follow for asking people on a date. They just don't realize they're following them because again, social skills, they come so automatic to so many people. So this is what you're supposed to do. First thing is you have to wait for the right time to ask them out. There shouldn't be other people around. They shouldn't be in the middle of something or they're busy or something. Wait for the right time. Trading information is the term that we use for having a good reciprocal conversation. You usually talk to them at least a few times before you ask the person out. Well, the goal in trading information or having a conversation to be should be to find common interests. That's what we teach them to do. So what you do to ask them out is you mention the common interest. So maybe the, the common interest was sushi, like the, the previous example. Um, and so you mentioned the common interest. Hey, have you seen, gone to that new sushi place around the corner? Or you kind of get that into the conversation. Um, and then you don't ask them out outright. You kind of ask what they're doing at a certain time. Like, hey, have you been to that new sushi place? No, I haven't. I've been wanting to check that out. Yeah, well, what are you doing this weekend? Right? So that's where you're kind of asking what they're doing at a certain given time. Then you have to assess their interest. Right? If they're saying, mm, I'm kind of busy this weekend. Does that sound good? Is that a good sign? You're going to abort the mission at that point. You're not going to ask that person out because they don't want to go out with you, right? But even if maybe they said, oh, I'm busy, like they sound disappointed, that's a good sign. So, that, so they seem interested. You can proceed by using the common interest as a cover story for asking them out, for going on a date. Well, hey, let's go get some sushi this weekend. Or let's go check that place out. If you haven't ever exchanged contact information, that's where that would happen. And then you tell them when you're going to follow up, when you're going to give them a call or a text. All right, so I want to show you what that's supposed to look like, and then I want to give you a little, little snapshot of our research in this area. So watch to see what Gabe does right this time. Hey, Alina, how are you? Hey, Gabe, I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. What did you do this weekend? I just went to see a movie with some friends. Oh, was it a sci-fi movie? I remember you telling me you really like sci-fi movies. Yes, it was a sci-fi movie. Did you hear about that new one coming out this weekend? Of course, I totally want to see that. Me too. It sounds like it's going to be really, really good. Yeah, that's what I heard. Well, what are you up to this weekend? Um, nothing. Would you maybe want to go see the movie with me? Yeah, that sounds great. Awesome. Well, can I get your contact information so we can plan it out? Sure, of course. It's 555-1313. All right, great. I'll give you a text this weekend. We'll okay. plan it out. That sounds great. Awesome. Okay. Oh, how cute is that? By the way, do you have autism to benefit from learning this skill? 
do you have to have autism to benefit? Or no, I mean, this is great. Like, everyone should have to learn how to do this stuff. All right, so um, again, I wanted to give you some tools here, but I also want to give you a little snapshot for what we kind of see in terms of our outcomes. Peers is one of the only evidence-based social skills programs out there. There have been dozens of papers published on our adolescent and our, our um, young adult programs. And um, I wanted to give you a, a snapshot of our most recent randomized control trial with young adults. And this was young adults aged um, 18 to 24 years of age. We had two different groups that we randomized them to either receive treatment immediately or there was a delayed treatment control group. And then we did a 16-week follow-up assessment with both groups. And this is what we found. In yellow here is the treatment group, those who received peers immediately. The blue is the delayed treatment control group. They were waiting for treatment. And this is the change in scores. And you see a really dramatic increase in social responsiveness on the social responsiveness scale. This uses T-scores. It's a full standard deviation change from just pre- to post-tests. Also very nice improvements in overall social skills on the social skills rating system. These use standard scores with uh, a standard de deviation of 15, and we get about a 12-point standard score improvement. It's almost a full standard deviation. That's not just statistically significant, right? That's clinically meaningful. On average, they were having about four, almost four additional get-togethers in the previous month, and we also saw nice improvements in things like um, social um, motivation, uh, decreased autistic mannerisms, more assertion, they're putting themselves out there more, and they're behaving more cooperatively. When we look at the follow-up, now here, um, the treatment starts at time two. This is the delayed treatment control group. They're just waiting for treatment. This is the period from T2 to T3 where there's treatment. You see a nice decrease in autism symptoms in both groups. It maintains very nicely 16 weeks after the intervention is over. Same thing with social skills. Nice improvement from pre to post test there. Maintains nicely 16 weeks later. Social skills knowledge, they learned what we taught them. They remembered most of what we taught them 16 weeks later. And we also saw a nice improvement in things like hosted get-togethers and invited get-togethers. People were actually seeking them out. And that was according to both the young adults and their caregivers. Um, one of the reasons I do think that we see such great outcomes even 16 weeks later, even one to five years later we've done follow-up, is because we include caregivers in the intervention. When you include caregivers, the program never ends even though it's a 16-week program. Just some final thoughts before I wrap up here. Um, I, what I do want to point out is that improving social outcomes in young adults is absolutely possible. Um, and evidence-based treatments to improve um, friendships and romantic relationships do exist. And many of them were developed here at UCLA through CART. And we are very, again, dedicated to disseminating these treatments across the globe. We do certified trainings. We train mental health professionals and educators. We publish manuals. But we do need more evidence-based treatments to improve social outcomes for this population, particularly related to employment, um, romantic relationships, sexual health and safety, independent living. And we also need more targeted interventions for those with cognitive um, limitations. We, um, Dr. McCracken uh, mentioned earlier today that we have a study looking at L-DOPA using the peers intervention. I wanted to put that on your radar. It's in your slides that you all have access to online. And we just got a wonderful um, donation from Northwestern Mutual, thanks to John Clem and Chow, uh, Cho Lee, um, who actually are supporting our College to Career Transition program, which includes didactic lessons using peers for careers. This is going to be starting in the fall. And we're working with Dr. Amanda Goldsrud and Jim McCracken, and this will be an exciting new um, research program at UCLA. We also have a new program coming out just focusing on dating etiquette. This is all in your slides, again, if you want to get more information. And then we also provided you with some of our resources. We do certified trainings in our young adult program. This is our published manual. We also have certified trainings for our adolescent program and our school-based programs. There also are, is information about our clinic programs. We, not, we don't just do research here at UCLA. We actually see patients as well. And these are some of the services that we provide. So thank you so much um, for your attention to our great team. And um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Bill Keimer. Thank you.